And we're live. Welcome to the Sono Show, episode 43, The Crow's Nest. Tonight I'm talking to a friend that I have known of for probably about three years now. And uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I've listened to his podcast. He is the owner and operator of the website Blackbird Nines Trading Posts. He is... Uh, a pretty big name on the Republican, the Republic Broadcasting Network. He's also host of the Saturday Snack Shack and uh, the Wednesday Show. Is that called the Breakfast Club, or is it Wacky Wednesday? Well, the Breakfast Club. You know, great. Well, first, thank you for having me. The Breakfast oh, Club yeah. Show. We discon. Uh, we stopped that after seven years, but RBN is now repeating it. Uh, rerunning those, the best of the Breakfast Club on Sunday nights after Robert Ravolt's show. So okay. they, they are re uh, purposing those show <laughs> Breakfast Club shows. So that's yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, yeah, you know, you uh, I first learned of you. I think uh, I think it was from uh, Professor Hillbilly a few uh, years back. And then also uh, one of my friends, uh, his YouTube channel, he comes into the chat sometimes. A guy named Didymus Sumi did. He uh, he is who first. That's where I was like, oh man, he knows Blackbird Nine as well. So that's awesome. Um, so yeah, it's uh, how how long? How many years have you been into this now, producing your own stuff? Oh wow, yeah. Uh, we launched the Breakfast Club show back in around 2015 and ran that for seven years and then uh my snack shack show got picked up by speak free radio and rbn and yes. uh then uh rbn's continuing to air the saturday snack shack and then they've like i said they've started taking the second hour of the breakfast club shows which is kind of a if you remember the late great paul harvey the rest of the yes. story where he would tell these you know yes, interesting histories that everybody knew but then he would tell you the stuff that you didn't know about it you know the rest of the story is he would say so yes. i always say you know the breakfast club second hour was a deep dive of history uh for a post 9 11 audience and yeah so <laughs> there you go you're getting into some heavy stuff already um, what was that Paul Harvey, uh, there's a Paul Harvey monologue. Uh, I think it's titled if I was the devil, if I were Is, the devil. Yes. Yes. Uh, that I remember hearing that when I was a uh, much younger man and, you know, it kind of left an impression on me. Um, I was just curious, you know, I named this stream the crow's nest because my channel logo on YouTube is a Raven yours. You have the Ravens as well. Um, what, what made you name yourself Blackbird Nine? I've always wondered this. <laughs> that, um, that is a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer, uh, but that just kind of came uh, when I was, you know, basically for the audience not familiar with my work, I was one of those guys that was backstage on 9-11. I was doing communications work and, I became a 9-11 truther on 9-11 yes. uh, when the two big things to me were, of course, building seven and the magic cell phone calls that were physically impossible. And at the time I was doing training on, you know, that type of telephony to agencies like the CIA, the FBI, NSA, et cetera. And, you know, that if anybody knew that, cell phone calls from a plane traveling at that speed at that altitude were physically impossible it should have been my students right and so the idea of you know the uh blackbird uh the sr-71 you know, yeah the sr-71 yeah. plane that was just kind of at the you know <clears throat> looking down at everything and uh that kind of became my uh icon uh, in my work to try to get the truth out that, you know, folks were being lied to about the illegal electronic surveillance and also, you know, 9-11 itself. And so that kind of yeah. became my avatar. And plus crows are just cool. Yeah. They are. They, they, <laughs> the crows are amazing. Absolutely. You know, I've always had a sort of fascination from a young age. I remember, I remember me and my, 
my old man, when I was probably around seven or eight, we were taking a trip up to the local state park uh, there where I'm from in northeast Tennessee. And there were some crows that were uh, feasting on some sort of roadkill. And my dad's like, you, you ever notice, son, that uh, crows are never uh, you never you hardly ever see them as roadkill. It's because they're extremely intelligent. And, you know, I kind of have like I'm kind of into Odinism. So, ever you know, Odin's Ravens, Hugin and Munin. And there's also been two times in my life that I have felt that a crow has warned me of impending danger. I know that sounds kooky. I know it sounds crazy, but I swear by it. And that's why I wanted to name this stream the Crow's Nest. Uh, two crows hanging out. So um i was gonna well, uh well one ahead. thing you know about that was you know one of the other aspects of this was the old you know since you brought up you know the thought and memory of odin but also in greek mythology you know in greek mythology the story goes that crows were all originally white yeah. but one of the crows went and told on uh, one of the uh, gods for his infidelity, and as a curse, they were turned black, and it became a symbol of that truth that you don't want to know, you know, that uncomfortable truth. And so that was the other part of this, was I realized that the entire world had just been put through this huge psychological operation of trauma programming, and that anything that contradicted the original story, no matter how truthful, people were going to have a rough time with it. It's like that, you know, oh, these yeah. are uncomfortable truths, and as I call them, hate facts, but, you know, it's like the truth nonetheless. And so yes. that was one of the other reasons for, the, you know, the Blackbird 9 uh, moniker. So I always nice. like that story. I mean, <clears throat> heck, I've... Uh... Like I said, I've listened to several of your podcasts. You interviewed uh, Dennis Wise, I guess, when was it? Back in 2015, 2016? It was a while back, yes. That was a great was interview. really enjoyed working with him, yes. He did some incredible work on the esoteric nature of the Freemasons. Oh, really nice. And, and, and I know he, uh, of course, <clears throat> What I know him for is he made the uh, the greatest story never told. He produced yes. that, and that was really instrumental in my awakening. I guess you could say. Uh, I remember it was back in it was back in the summer of 2016. My old man was like, "Hey, you ain't got no plans this evening. Come up here and watch this documentary with me." And we went up there to watch it. You know, it took, we watched it over about three days. Cause if I remember correctly, it's about six and a half hours long. Yeah. That, <laughs> that is an undertaking. I think it is almost seven hours long. Yeah. But. Yeah. It was instrumental. My dad though, my dad started going down this rabbit hole back in like 2007. Um, he had worked as a machinist for about 27 years. Um, for a large uh, tool producing company. They produce tools and stuff uh, actually up in Johnson city, Tennessee worked there for 27 years and uh, they closed his plant down and he bounced around from jobs. And I remember back then he started tell like mentioning the federal reserve and the Rothschilds, you know, and I was like, Hmm, but it wasn't until years later, I really started to consider some of these things. Um, I was going to, I was going to ask you just a little bit about your uh, about your bra uh, background there. You said that you worked in, I guess, communications for years. Yeah, uh, I was on that bleeding edge of the technology. I went to you know uh, school for engineer, electrical and computer engineering. Yes. And uh, my first job out of university was for a think tank in North Carolina. North Kakalaki, yes. uh, there in Research Triangle Park called Research Triangle Institute. And it was about, you know, 3,000 people, business, and, a, you know, huge campus there in Research Triangle Park between Raleigh and Chapel Hill and Durham. Yes, yes. And they had satellite offices, you know, everywhere. And also we did research, a lot of government research. So I was tying in all these government agencies and uh, also military 
agencies into our computers. And this is, you know, before the internet. So we were having to do all the, and none of the computers spoke the same language back then. That was the maddening part of it, was trying yeah. to hook up all these various different computers to each other so they could, you know, uh, share all this information. And from there went into um, uh, the worked for a couple of startups. I worked for uh, IBM in their network hardware division. And then when they closed down their network hardware division, we formed a company called Networking Bootcamp Company where we were training uh, IBMers from around the world on Cisco product lines. So uh, basically IBM said, we're not gonna make our own networking gear anymore. We're gonna use Cisco gear. So we gotta train all these IBM people. So I became, uh, moved from being a you know engineer, t- uh, t- and then a fix it guy, software debugger, to a course developer and trainer, yeah. and I got noticed by this outfit called Global Knowledge out of Cary, North Carolina, in the late '90s, and they uh, asked me to help them develop a set of courses. Uh, for them, and this, they were a big international tr- technical training, you know, IT training company. And this was, you know, the early days of cell phones. And so back then, you had the computer networks and you had the telephone networks, and never the two shall meet, right? Yeah. They were completely different technologies, packet switching and circuit switching for people that are in that kind of stuff. And so this was the beginning of what was called third generation telephony. Now we talk about fifth generation telephony. Back then in the 90s, it was third generation telephony, where we said we're going to make that telephone, that computer, and that cell phone work on the same network, right? And yes. so I was uh, developed these classes for them on this new technology called voice over IP. So you were actually doing voice telephony over the internet, right? And the clients just happened to be, you know, the U.S. military, government agencies, uh, like I said, the NSA, CIA, FBI, state agencies, like FBI, uh, SBI, et cetera. Yeah. And so, the, <laughs> unfortunately, wow. uh, that's when I realized that all of these telcos and the NSA were basically – uh, not following the game rules when it came to both the Fourth Amendment and also the FISA. Uh, if you're familiar with the FISA Act of, you know, when can you do electronic surveillance yeah. on people, right? Yes. And, you know, what I was finding at the same time, I was still pursuing a career in politics, if you can believe that. Wow, was, so you, uh, you had a lot on your plate, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, I was actually uh, in the run-up to a 9-11. Yeah, I was just huge in the state party politics. I was, you know, chair of my county. I yeah. was uh, on the executive board at the state level. I was a uh, delegate to the national convention. I uh, ran for North Carolina House in 20, 2002. Um And, you know, so basically I was like, you know, the NSA is, you know, they're cheating. They're, you know, they're basically vacuuming up everything and spying on the citizens. Yeah. And so I was, you know, trying to, you know, teach in my classes about, you know, okay, the Fourth Amendment and this is the FISA Act to all these 20 somethings that were being told by their managers that they can spy on anybody anywhere what the Fourth Amendment, the Constitution means is they just can't use what they find in a court of law. And I'm like, no, no, (laughs) no, no. And uh, so my NSA uh, handler was like, okay, we want you to take that out, that out, that out. Oh, and one of the first big giveaways was, if you know anything about the NSA, one of their charters, like the CIA, is they're never supposed to do anything on U.S. soil, right? Yeah. And so I was developing these classes for an international audience. I was working with all the telcos around the world, French Telecom, you know, British Telecom, you name it. Uh, and so 
when I was working with the NSA, I said, well, I'm assuming that you want the European signaling version of the classes. So it's because the U.S. used a type of signaling called T1 signaling, like Tango signaling, and the okay. rest of the world uses the signaling called E1, which is like Echo 1, uh, which, you know, not compatible. And the first red flag was when the NSA said, no, we want the you know, T1 version. And I'm like, so you plan to use this on, you know, on, on US civilians. citizens, right? Yes. And uh, so I promptly had my career completely destroyed. I you know, was living the dream, had, you know, my very successful business. I had yes. my political career. I was the ascending star of the party. You know, I had my, you know, lovely wife and my how my farm, you name it, you know. Yes. And next thing I know, I'm living out of my car in a tent. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And one of the big things uh, was uh, I got my uh, last class uh, before I got blacklisted. I was supposed to fly out to uh, San Diego to work with Naval Intelligence. And... I uh, went to get my itinerary on that Friday, and this was February in 2003, and I was locked out of my account, and so I called the you know, technical staff, and they're like, oh, Mr. Blackmore, we're so sorry, you know, and then they called me right back and said, oh, we're sorry, uh, you need to contact the vice president of instructor services. And I'm like, wow. okay. And uh, call, and this person that had just, you know, I used to be her best buddy pal, you know, I was just doing all kinds of miracles for the company. And suddenly I just got the meanest, coldest Jew, New York Jew you could ever imagine oh, wow. telling me that my services would no longer be needed. And I'm like, I've got a five year contract with you. And she says, we'll outlast you in court. And North Carolina being a blue eyed state, my lawyer basically said that, well, there's not much you can do if they want to fly, fire you, you know, for the color of your eyes, they can fire you in North Carolina. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it was interesting that, you know, immediately, uh, you know, got uh, shut down Pretty and much black fired. Black yeah. Black and yeah. Uh, that was the thing is. If you remember in 2003, in March, or just a month later, is when we invaded Iraq under totally cooked yes. intelligence, right? And one oh, of the yeah. things I was trying to prove, I'd already proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the telcos and the ISPs were working with the NSA to basically sweep up everything, and companies like Booz Allen Hamilton were writing the software for this, you know, basically analysis and, you know, doing a threat assessment on the U.S. population, right? And yeah. I was trying to prove that there was a back door behind the NSA, and I got fired before I could finally prove that part. And then in 2013, 10 years later, after I got blacklisted, Edward Snowden came out with the proof from Booz Allen Hamilton that, yes, indeed, there was a pipe behind the NSA going to their Unit 8200 that they were just sending raw copies of everything to. Yes. So, I, I, remember, uh, I remember in 2013 hearing the news about uh, Edward Snowden and, you know, the NSA uh, being able to access everything, any message you sent, any phone yes. call. Um, you know, that was actually... I found that to be rather horrifying. Um, you know, you really don't have any privacy. I mean, with technology, it seems like it's, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I worry uh, where all of this is headed, you know? Um, so you've had a very, very interesting ex uh, life experience, a really interesting <laughs> life story for sure, man. It's uh, I was going to ask uh, you're, you're from North Carolina originally, right? Right. My uh, family comes, you know, in these Appalachian mountains, you know, they can trace the fa Blackburn family line, you know, to colonial times. Yeah. And uh, now in full disclosure, I was actually born on a military base in New Mexico and my father was still in the Air Force. But, you know, North Carolina is home. So as soon as he retired, I was born basically at the beginning of the, or at the end of 62. And at the uh, end of that year, 
uh, you know, we moved back to North Carolina where, you know, the family was. Yeah. Uh, so, but, you know, I'm definitely a, you know, Tar Heel and blood. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm a volunteer just across the state line from you. So, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, hell, I mean, I was born uh, actually in Banner Elk, North Carolina at the old hospital up there. Oh, okay. In Avery we still had. Back when we still had four hospitals in this county before the uh, chicken swingers moved in and fixed that for us. Now we only oh, have yeah. one. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's wild. Uh, I've listened to your uh, covering of this, like the, the 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 actions of like the city hall and all the the local politicians there in Boone, North Carolina. And I mean, it sounds, you know, I live in Southeast Tennessee now. I still go back home, you know, every every few months or so check on my place, visit my family. I haven't been to Boone, North Carolina. I don't think since back in 2018. Um, I know Boone was always, I, I went to college at East Tennessee state over there in Johnson city and Appalachian state, you know, is basically about the same distance from uh, where I was raised on the mountain. I always noticed that there in Boone, like the people that I met there through work and, uh, just doing whatever, you know, a college kid does. Uh, it seems like I, I noticed that they were much more liberal over there, which of course, you know, you have your liber you lit your lib shits in like East Tennessee, of course, it's a college, but I noticed that it seemed like Boone was going the route that Asheville, North Carolina has went. Uh, yeah, go ahead. What was you going to say? Oh, just, yeah, you're spot on. And when you, start doing the history of it and look at the Frankfurt school in Germany. When they got ran out of Germany in the 1930s, they came to Columbia university in New York, but before they went to Columbia university, a lot of them came to Asheville at black mountain college. Okay. And when black mountain college was finally shut down for being degenerate communists, you yeah. know, a lot of those people came to Boone and you know, a lot of them went to Asheville and destroyed Western Carolina there, but a lot of them infiltrated themselves into Boone. And, you know, it's always been, you know, not always, but you know, there you could definitely see in the 70s this big push to make this very conservative teacher's college into this radical liberal college. And yeah. then after 9-11, ju it just really just to the max where they basically infiltrate it with about 200 of them with their ill-gotten gains, just bags of money, you know, carpet baggers with money, and just started buying up everything. They bought up the newspaper, you know, the, the Watauga Democrat, you know, the yeah. Adams family bought that, you know, was, uh, and they are just long time, you know, propagandists, you know, Cedric Adams, uh, the the voice of the Midwest, you know, he got his start doing war propaganda to convince the Midwest that, you know, we needed to go into World War II, right? Oh, wow. yeah. And then his son, Stephen Adams, was skull and bones at Yale, right? And they bought up, you know, the newspaper, then they put in this, you know, chancellor here, I call all the locals call her Jezebel, but Sherry really? Everts. And, you know, she is just the epitome of the, you know, militant lesbian, you know, I hate everything to do with white men, white men culture has to be destroyed. And the first thing she did when she got the position was emasculate the college. You know, all the old white Christian local professors were fired or demoted and then replaced with all these, you know, radical liberals you know, and homosexuals and everything else from out of state. And they, yeah. did, and they suddenly declared that, you know, Appalachian State University was no longer about providing t qualified teachers for the public school systems of North Carolina, but now was the mandate to create global citizens. And, yeah. you know, it's like, wow, you know, that they actually put on their mission statement that they are there to be a, you know, uh, school to produce global citizens. 
and that they are all about diversity inclusivity and it has just been a horrifying textbook examination of the Calergi plan of how to destroy a high uh, trust white Christian community with bringing in the third world and yes. the Cloward Piven plan of we're going to just flood the area until all the resources start falling apart. You know, that's all about stressing the resources so it will, the system will collapse and then it can be replaced with a Soviet style system. And so her mandate was, you know, she was going to double the size of the college. Yeah. And you know, if you've when ever been this? to Boone, this was, you know, around 2016, 2017 okay. is when she, you know, uh, started making all of her changes. See, I, uh, I, I hadn't kept track, track of it. I, I remember back in uh, 05, 06 and 07. That's when that was when I started college. Mm -hmm. That was that. Those were the years, I believe, that uh, App State won the uh, division, the FCS. They won the national championship. Brought a lot of publicity. You remember they beat Michigan that first game of the year. That was the big push that they were going to ramp up their athletics program to put them on the map. Yes. And, you know, that, and where did all of that money come from to say Appalachian needs this, you know, high ranking football team? You know, yeah. and up to that point, Appalachian really didn't, they had teams, but it wasn't anything like, you know, State of Carolina or Duke or anything, but suddenly it was just important that, you know, they have this and they destroyed half the town putting in, you know, the big stadiums, et cetera. And, uh, one of the big scandals up here around 2008, 2009 was when they passed this big a law that condemned all the old properties on the main road, the 421 highway into Boone because ESPN's contracts, if they were going to cover your sports stuff, part of their contract is you had to have this many lanes of traffic in and out of the stadiums, right? Wow. See, I, wasn't, <laughs> like, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, wow. and it's like, okay, so we're sacrificing, you know, the heritage, the you know, the history, all these old, old houses that had been here forever, just gotten businesses. So many independent family businesses just got, you know, condemned, will buy you out. And there's nothing you can do at you know eminent domain, and to see half the town just get demolished and then put in a four lane highway, and then you know strip malls on either side and you know hotels. Yeah. You know, it's like okay, now it looks like just any other town as you come into it. You know, now we've got yes. all our goy slop, you know, fast food places, etc when originally you had all these incredible houses that still had the old spring houses. Yellow. If you know what a spring house Blue. is for keeping things cold, you know, where you had all this yes. natural springs coming off the hills all along there. The old Billy refrigerator. Yeah, and all of those springs got tapped out and routed into the sewer lines. And, you know, all those old historics, a lot of them were stone houses, you know, from the you know, rocks around here that were just, you know, should have been preserved under historical, you know, claims, but instead were completely destroyed so that App State could have their, you know, champion sports ball team, you know? Yeah. And again, first thing they did was stop recruiting white guys, yep. you know, <laughs> and suddenly yep. it was like every you know, person on their athletic teams were these angry black guys, right? Yep. Um, you know, that's something that I've noticed, I think, is what they've tried to do in the South as well, you know, decades ago. You know, it's like bring in college football, bring in all these blacks and all these, you know, brings in all this money. You know, that's kind of like a gateway. It's a way for them to, uh, you know, raise up that uh, startup money for the changes they want to make. Um, I wanted to go back a second. You mentioned earlier, what was it, Black Mountain College? Right. Yeah, well, what? let's hear about that place. Oh, Black Mountain College was, you know, that was uh, all those radical commie Jews from the Frankfurt School, 
went and set up a college, Black Mountain College, outside of Asheville, and were basically, you know, and you know, in radical programming of you know the communist Marxist method in the Appalachian Mountains to undermine you know the old white Christian communities, and yeah. it was just completely radical. People like you know uh, Adorno and uh, trying to think, you know, one person that was there that you know I still have respect for, of course, is Bucky Full Buckminster Fuller. Uh, and you know, his work, you know, he was part of it, but the majority of them were these, you know, radical Jews, um, for, that had got thrown out of Germany. Yeah. And, That's uh, interesting. That reminds me a bit of the, uh, Highlander folk school. That was exact over. same thing. Same sort of know, principle. Same, yeah. Exactly. And of course that's where people like, you know, uh, uh, you know, Mike King, otherwise known as Martin Luther King, yes, and uh, Rosa Parks was and trained Rosa there. Parks, yeah, they were trained Marxists. But um, Theodore Dreyer um, was part of this. Uh, let's see here, I'm trying to get some of the uh, big names. Let's see. When did uh when did they shut down Black Mountain? Yeah, it uh, got fi- the FBI finally shut them down in fifty seven, but they went from nineteen thirty three to oh, nineteen fifty seven, wow. and like I said, a lot of them you know went back up to Columbia University. Uh, yeah, you know, they, did Eleanor? Uh, Ro- I was going to ask, did Eleanor Roosevelt have any connections there? Because she was, <laughs> I'm sure at some yeah. point, you know, either overt or covert. Yeah, she was connected. She visited and donated large sums to that uh, Highlander Folk School. Mm-hmm. Uh, it yeah. started in Monteagle, Tennessee, which I think is in Grundy County. It's somewhere. It's a little. It's a few counties west of me. But uh, I, uh, I've done quite a bit of research into the Highlander Folk School. They were based. The concept of that came from these Danish socialist schools, right? Um, and except over here in America, you know, especially the South, they're like, hey, let's get the other races in on this, you know. Um, so it's it's fascinating. You know, There's that's something I've tried to keep track of. Me and uh, Patrick have tried to keep track of. It's all these little, uh, say, schools like the Black Mountain College or the Highlander Folk School or these little NGOs like there's, – there's so many of them. There's numerous ones. There's uh, – let's see concerned Appalachians. They they're based up in Southwest Virginia and basically they want to promote homosexuality, uh, anti-racism, you know, just the typical, uh, anti-white propaganda that you see so prevalent. And these, uh, these little organizations, they just want to worm their way up into the haulers and change the culture. You know, that's it. They want, you know, this high trust, what, you know, High functioning white Christian communities destroyed, and the way to do that is you know, wrap yourself in virtue and say, "Oh no, we have to be inclusive. We have to embrace diversity." And it's interesting that you know Sherry Everett's over at App State. You know, all she talks about is diversity, diversity, inclusivity. This is a welcoming place for everybody, and the first thing she does is ban identity Europa as being a hate group and yeah. you had the Wataga Democrat and the ADL and the SPLC and the NAACP all saying, yes, identity Europa is a hate group. They must be shunned. And I'm like, okay, so the people that actually built this university, European stock, are no longer welcome under this umbrella of diversity inclusivity but you can have everything from la raza chapters you know to lgbt group you know trans groups yeah you name it app state embraces it but no white pride is allowed at all nothing that celebrates european heritage is allowed because that's hateful you know, and you just look at, you know, who are the people that are now in charge of that university? And it's not the, you know, it's definitely not the Dotry brothers anymore that founded the university. Uh, and it's just, you, you, fought, you know, basically it's the same trick as, you know, 
uh, follow the money. You just flood yes. it with money. You know, she makes something like three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars a year to destroy the Heritage Appalachia. She makes three seventy-five k. Wow. That was you know the last check. You know, she's probably gotten a few more raises, and who knows what her portfolio and all her kickbacks. Oh yeah, from, absolutely. You know, the all favors. This, yeah, you know all this you know construction, and you know, she's always talking about we're going to build this and we're going to build that, and you go and look at the job sites. You know, local North Carolina contract firms never get the contracts. You look at the people that are working, there's not a single white guy. Yeah, it's all Mexicans. Mexicans and blacks and you name it, right? But it's, you know, this is going to help the community by providing jobs, you know? And it's like, no, it's not, you know? It's, It's such a lie. You know, that's one thing about Northeast Tennessee, as I've noticed, is we have kind of been spared. We're not... At the, you know, that's, I guess there's a lot more money in Western North Carolina. Perhaps there's a lot more tourism because, I mean, y'all got, you know, Boone, Asheville. You have the highest peak east of the Rockies, Mount Mitchell. Um, lots of, I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. But the Blue Ridge Parkway. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, it's absolutely beautiful, but east, northeast Tennessee, we've kind of been spared that because it's more, uh, more of a depressed region for the mm-hmm. most part. Um, you know, that's one of the things I, one of the uh, observations I've came to over time is that prosperity brings wider erasure, you could say. It really does. Unfortunately, it don't have to be that way, but uh, if you think, look at the people that control the purse strings, the big contracts and all this, it's just like, yeah, that's on the agenda for sure. Um, well, also one of the things that we have here is, all of these people fleeing New York, California, Oregon, uh, and Washington are coming here and they're bringing their ill-gotten gains and their politics. So, yeah. you know, the politics that destroyed those states and those once beautiful cities, they're bringing that same philosophy here and, you know, thinking they're just going to set up their own little gated community here in the mountains of North Carolina and ride out the apocalypse in their gated communities yeah. and, you know, are just destroying our way of life. And they just, you know, well, we've got to get progressive candidates. And so basically, you know, they've run all the old local families out of local politics and it's now just this radical, uh, you, know, pr- you know, virtue signaling uh, bunch of, you know, puppet politicians that are just basically getting, you know, their agendas from up above and they've run it through and it's always unanimous votes. The Boone City Council voted that, you know, we support Pride Month and the Boone City Council unanimously says that, you know, hate has no place here and that any anti-Semitism will not be tolerated and, you know, that we are a diverse, welcoming community by unanimous consent and, you know, they don't allow any discussion of any of this stuff is like, you know, you're either, you know, with us or you're, you know, we're going to destroy you. You know, that's basically the attitude here. And yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've always, I've always been interested in hearing your stories about the inner, about the uh, inner workings of up, how things are going up there in Boone, North Carolina. You know, that's, that's one of the heartbreaking things too, is, you know, Boone and Asheville, are two, are two towns that are in possibly uh, the most beautiful areas east of the Mississippi River. Yeah, look what, I mean, it's an absolute uh, cesspool, you know. I mean, especially Asheville, North Carolina. Good grief. <laughs> I have heard so many horror stories from there. Um, oh, I mean, it's not safe to for a white person to go to Asheville anymore. And that used to be one of the most beautiful tourist towns to go to. And they fixed it, and it's the same people with the same agenda, and they're doing it here. Um, you know, the same, you know, Calergy plan, Cloward Piven plan. And, you know, yeah. one of the things that was funny about Asheville, they finally had to admit that they spent all of this money on these electric buses, right? Oh, wow. 
<laughs> and none of them are running. I think maybe they've got one that's still working on limited routes or whatever, but they can't get replacement parts for them. And it's cost prohibitive. And the other, it's this big embarrassment to them that they spent all this money in the same thing here, you know, Boone bought its electric bus and Boone bought its electric police cars. And it's like, <laughs> how are they doing in these, you know, winter weather when you got sub zero temperatures? Have any of them caught on fire yet? You know? Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a staunch. See, I wasn't aware of that. I know, I do know. Uh, have you ever heard of William Dudley Paley before? That sounds for me, but go ahead. Who's uh, William? He was. Let's see. Basically, he lived in Asheville, North Carolina for a period of time. Uh, he started a group called the Silver Shirts. And I don't know. Oh, was. yes. That's where I know him from. Yeah. Oh, yes. You know, that started there. But it's also like now on the other side of the extreme, it's like Antifa. They have a very strong presence from what I hear in Asheville. Um Go ahead. What was you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say, you know, Asheville and Boone both have huge Antifa BLM factions. Yes. Uh, that are just completely radical. And also we have a very radical uh, LGBT group up here. I think every Jewish lesbian from New York and California suddenly decided after 9-11 that they needed to move to Todd, North Carolina and go oh, to work for no. Appalachian State University and make the lives miserable of every white guy in the county. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's their, their I mean, they chicken. are the most miserable dragons you could ever ever imagine and they just get off on messing with the locals that they just yeah. you know and they've got plenty of money of course and you know i was gonna i just wanted to tell this story real quick and it, it's gonna lead to a question i wanted to ask you here here when i finish it but i've got a few friends who have our views in western north carolina uh around one of them is in buncombe county and he told me this story a couple of years ago Somewhere in Buncombe County, if I remember correctly, that's the county that Asheville is in. Yes. Um, but he lives, you know, probably about 20, 25 miles, I guess, from it. And there's a little gun range. And it's a gun range, rifle range, that's kind of just set up out in the woods. It's nothing special. It's, uh, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, there's nobody working it. There's not a membership. It's just a place for people to go and plink and, he said on Saturdays he would take his two uh, sons there and uh, ever so often, and they'd go, you know, just fire off a few rounds. Uh, he said there was rarely – rare, you may see like one or two other people there, but it's really – it's kind of secluded away from everything. But he said there was one particular Saturday morning that he went there with his two boys, and they were going to test out this, uh, this new deer rifle they got, uh, you know, zero it in and everything. Well – he told me that there were these two black vans that pulled up. He said there were the two people in the front seat were clean cut. They had glasses, collared shirts. And he said out of the back of the van, there were four to six of the most AIDS, the most AIDS riddled, just degenerate, just scum of the earth, Antifa looking tops, had blue hair, pink hair. And they, those men were instructing them how to use firearms, how to use an AR-15, how to shoot. And it was like, I was like, man, that sounds like you, you may have inadvertently seen some sort of weird governmental intelligence activity. You know, that's, uh, that's the kind of stuff that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up, to be honest. When I hear a stories like that, it's like, Man, what are these what are these people that are clean cut, crew cut, you know, why are they teaching these absolute degenerates that really look like they probably couldn't even hold a rifle? Why are they teaching them to shoot? You know? So that leads me to the question I wanted to ask you. Is there a lot of weird activity, do you believe, that goes on in the state of North Carolina with say the CIA or these various sort of intelligence agencies? Oh, there is all kinds of stuff. It is not just domestic stuff. There was a big uh, expose during the Obama years 
where basically you were, you know, if you remember Fast and Furious, where <laughs> he basically were, had drugs and guns running, right? And yeah. it was all about getting the guns into the hands of, you know, the you know, people invading the country. But also, you know, you have these groups that bring in people from like the IDF, you know, to train okay. up in these mountains, right? And a lot of these Jewish summer camps up here, you're always joking about all the Jewish summer camps in North Carolina that pride themselves on how many, you know, high ranking IDF and Shin Bet and, you know, uh, uh, you know, Mossad uh, officials, they bring in to work with the kids, right? Wow. <laughs> and, you know, Is and there... Then, you're telling me there's a lot of Jewish summer camps in Western North Carolina. Oh yes, do a search on that. Then they are high dollar, and they it's wow. pretty amazing. How big uh, is the Jewish population in Boone by chance? See, I didn't know they had much of a Jewish. Population. We didn't until I <laughs> wow. Up until you know in the 1970s, you had just a couple of Jews, and they would meet together at the Lutheran church. The Lutheran church would let them meet there. But then after 9/11, you had the Sha you know, the Schaefer gals. I have another term for them, yeah. but they are the <laughs> um, yeah, hardcore lesbians, friends of you know uh, uh, Gloria Steinem, and their father made his billions from the Claire stores and all the U.S. shopping, or actually the Claire stores and shopping malls around the world. I mean, the guy just made billions, you know, selling Chinese crap made by slave labor in China to teenage girls, right? To yeah. make them act like prostitutes, right? And that's the Claire stores. And so they came in and just basically started buying up influence and with philanthropy, you know, they put in the high country temple, right? So they put in this really nice synagogue, synagogue right across the street from the courthouse, of course, and right downtown Boone. And suddenly you had about 200 highly trained, highly uh, financed, you know, Marxist Jews move into this area and start setting up NGOs left and right and organizing the community. Yeah. Right. And the, you know, the Schaefer gals were joined by the uh, Leon Levine Foundation. And if you know Leon Levine, he was the person who had Family Dollar, the chain Family Dollar. Oh, no, not Family Dollar. Yes. Oh. And if you know, ever met anybody who worked for a Family Dollar, if they were a goyim, you, they would not have a single good thing to say about their experience working there. If you ever knew anybody who had a store in competition with a family dollar, they would have nothing good to say about this guy, right? So, yeah. you know, Leon Levine was just that ruthless merchant that, you know, had a store in every one of these southern towns. Uh, you know, it's one of those people go to work for him and he would fire you rather than give you a raise and just hire somebody else. I mean, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. Suddenly he's all about philanthropy and giving back to the community. And so he comes up here and sets up all the stuff with the university, sets up all these NGOs. And then you have the Rockefellers that aren't Jewish, but they are the, you know, John, the <laughs> demon spawn of John yeah. D. Rockefeller. Yes. And they're here to tacoon along the Appalachian Mountains by basically running all the heritage people off, buying up their land, and putting it under a land covenant so that you can no longer have a business on that land. You can never have a, far, a garden on that land anymore. You can yeah. never build a building on that land anymore. And they call it the... Blue Ridge Conservancy. Doesn't that sound nice? You know, it the Conservancy. Nice, and they have basically surrounded us here in our little mountain valley. 
that uh, Atma's family has owned since colonial times, and she and just a few of her relatives are the remaining ones. They've bought everybody else out, and we're basically under siege. I mean, you would yes. not believe the uh, covenant that they put us under uh, during the what we call the Battle for Blackjack Mountain, but, you know, it's all this NGO virtue signaling. We are fixing the high country of North Carolina, and by that, they mean they yeah. are destroying what was there so it could be replaced with the same crappy cities you see everywhere else. You know, you yeah. had something unique and you magical know. that up here, and they said, we got to destroy that, and that's what they're doing. And they're Absolutely. proud of it. You know, they, they are fixing oh, us yeah. to coon along. You know, what you just said about Family Dollar, I wasn't aware uh, of Levine, the guy that you had mentioned as the owner, the merchant. Um, but here's a little news for you. Just uh, back, you, you know where I'm born and raised, basically, um, just there up on the mountain. You know, we don't have many businesses in my hometown at all. Sadly, there's a Dollar General, which those things, they basically sp spread like the clap, unfortunately. Um, but in my hometown, there have been let's see, three different businesses. Uh, two of them were restaurants that were family owned, had been there for man since back in the 50s the other was a big garage you know what they're putting in to take the place of these businesses they're putting in a family dollar slash dollar tree like a a you know it's like a hybrid it's like both of these stores oh, wow. put together and i'm just like i'm like why in the hell why in the hell do we have another dollar store that's feeding, that's uh, selling the same old bullshit from china that is selling you know low quality just horrible processed food to make people fat. You know, why, why do we have this? And then I know, I remember on Facebook seeing the comments, like some people righteously were raising hell about it. My dad, he's like, what in the, what in the hell are they doing? You know, putting this shit here. We've already got a damn dollar general, but then I see the standard Brunlick comments. People are like, Oh, well, it's going to give jobs, jobs. You ain't going to uh, make, yes. I mean, these are jobs for teenage kids. And they're also jobs basically for drug addicts to help fund their habit that, that they don't want to, you know, rely on uh, criminality solely for their income. You know, I mean, it's like you can't you can't build a family with these jobs. You can't do anything. You know, I don't I don't understand it. You know, they're what's happening in Boone. I would imagine we're probably about 15 years behind what, say, Banner Elk and Boone, North Carolina is up there in northeast to see that's what i would foresee it as um i also meant to ask you too do you think there's a connection between you were talking about how all these uh jews had moved into like northwest north carolina around uh boone um do you this is around the time when oxycontin really started to take off you think there's a connection between that Oh, I was hoping we get to talk about the Sackler family that completely decimated yeah. this region yes, with their Oxycontin and Oxycodone and managed to somehow get forgiven for all their, you know, warfare. It was basically a chemical warfare. They were bribing these doctors to prescribe this stuff. They yes. got everybody hooked on it, and I saw so many people's lives and families destroyed because one of the family members, you know, had a back injury or, you know, something went to the doctor, and they said, here, have some happy pills, yeah. and they got hooked on it. You know, and yes, it's just amazing. You know, it was a, just a decimation of this region and it was focused. It was a ground offensive and we exposed that. But of course, they got, you know, pardoned. They got their immunity from prosecution. They had to pay. Yeah, they the company had to pay a fine. But, you know, the yep. Sackler family themselves were completely, you know, immune from prosecution when they should have been hanging from a tree. Yes, you know? and absolutely. You know, so you saw that come in. Then you saw all these you know, chicken swingers coming in with bags of money and buying up all these properties because the people had gotten strung out on drugs. And the other thing was the fentanyl coming into here. 
And yeah. so these families just losing everything and selling it out. And, and, you know, next thing you know, you've got gated communities everywhere where farmland used to be. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the Sackler family, you know, are complete war criminals and they should have been treated as such. But, you know, they got you know, totally forgetting that nobody talks about the Sackler family anymore. No, no, that's old news. There's a book yeah. I'd recommend to you called Empire of Pain. Look that book up. It goes, I mean, the Sackler family going back two or three generations, this is what they've always done. Um, I would recommend that book. If you ever find it, it's well worth reading. Um, yeah, they were it's the, basically a repeat of the opium wars, you know, with oh, the yeah, Sassoon family, yes. which were also Jews that, you know, weaponized opium and then weaponized heroin. And then, you know, the Oxycontin, you know, one of the things about going after 9-11, immediately going into Afghanistan was, wow, Let's put the uh, opium fields back into production that the Taliban, the students, had closed down, right? Yep, and destroyed. suddenly we're getting flooded with all this cheap Afghan heroin in here because people can no longer get prescription drugs. They can't get their oxy yes. anymore. So now they're buying street heroin, yep. right, or fentanyl. Right. And of course, the MS-13 aspect of this is, you know, all this MS-13 activity in here. And who are they coordinating with? Yeah. Yeah. NGOs. Yes. And, you know, you know, uh, another interesting thing, too, is, I mean, I used to be involved in that life somewhat. I used to have those problems. But back in, say, I remember it was like 2008, 2009, 2010, I had cousins that would go to those pain clinics down in Florida. Hell, I'd send them with a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, and they'd bring me back a bottle of pills. But, you know, where they would go to, they would go to Broward County, Florida. And if I remember correctly, it's interesting. Broward County has one of the highest uh, density uh, Jewish populations in this country, at least in the state of Florida, definitely. You know, I mean, it's all, you know, it's like Sig said here in the chat. He said, all have names, faces, and addresses. It's just yeah. a matter of uh, doing the research, uh, the mental search and find these things, you know? Well, it's interesting. Another little connection of the chicken swinging connection is in the run up to nine 11. Yeah. All of these rabbis, you know, Hasidic rabbis connection with Habad Lubavitch started getting arrested, smuggling in ecstasy from Israel. And everyone knows that, you know, in the 80s and 90s, Israel was the number one producer of ecstasy. I and did not had know that. The, yes. And I you had all that. of these hardcore you know, Zionist rabbis that were just doing the shuttle between Tel Aviv and New York. And then from New York, it, that ecstasy went everywhere so that whole rave culture uh you know in the came run up to 9 11 from came from tel, tel aviv right <laughs> so yeah, and yeah and then you know once the war started then that got replaced with the heroin money yeah. right so but all that ecstasy money was financing so many of those black ops and if you watch the band Fox News report of Carl Cameron uh, that came out in December after you know 9/11, where it was talking about all these Israelis, over 200 Israelis that got arrested before, on, or right after 9/11, and all had ties to Israeli intelligence, and they were running drugs and, you know, artwork, and most likely that artwork had bugs in it that they were, you know, yeah. selling to all these important government agencies. And wow. they had these really high-tech electronic uh, outfits where they were basically uh, – spying on all the DEA agents and all the local law enforcement. So, you know, they knew exactly where they were at all times and staying one step ahead of them. And they had all their informants and all these agencies. So that once, you know, the law enforcement would try to bust them, they'd change their operations. 
right? So you're dealing with a military grade operation here of running drugs under the guise of Israeli art students. And then after 9-11, they got rounded up. And rather than facing firing squads, which they should have, they all got deported back to Israel by Michael Chertoff under, uh, they call it, you know, basically visa violations, right? Yeah. So rather than, I mean, these, you had people in vans, right, with explosives arrested on 9-11 get sent back to Israel. And the story was, you know, just whitewashed from the news. So yes. if you haven't seen that four-part series by Carl Cameron on Fox News, you know, definitely go watch it. Believe it or not, it's, you know, you can still get it online. Yeah. You know, they tried to kill it, but, you know, the Internet is forever. Uh, but it is very telling of what was going on in the run-up and just how sophisticated an operation it was. Yeah. You know, I also wanted to ask you, too, do you know much about Blackwater? Oh, the uh, paramilitary uh, yeah, mercenary group? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Eric Prince. Prince. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, you know, I think they bought like 6,000 acres of land out there in uh, the Great Dismal Swamp uh, there in, you know, coastal uh, North Carolina, uh, northeast North Carolina, not far from the Virginia line. I think the Great Dismal Swamp actually takes up part of Virginia and North Carolina. Do you know much about them? You know, it was such an interesting story how they made their millions, you know, in the yeah. war on terror. And basically, you know, you had these privateers you know that could go in and do the black ops that you know military technically couldn't do yeah right? and this was you know that gray area of the war on terror that we were using so many of these security firms yes. you know embedded within the u.s military on these operations that weren't bothered with things like the rules of engagement you know? no, absolutely operating cia black sites yeah. across uh i mean it's it's some stuff that you know raises the hair on the back of my neck you know reading about this uh but yeah i was just curious if you knew that's also something uh about north carolina some of those weird activities it seems like each state i've, I've read a lot about some interesting activities that go on up in kentucky and also West Virginia, but I didn't know much about some of the stuff in North Carolina, but it seems like there's just weird uh, glowing sort of activities in a lot of these states. Oh, North Carolina is just so pathetic in that, you know, we were ground zero for the culture wars. It yeah. was kind of like if North Carolina falls, the rest of the South will fall. And so it's amazing just how much money and personnel went into corrupting North Carolina at every level. And North Carolina has some of the biggest military base and m more military bases than just about any state, except for like Texas, of course. Uh, yeah. But, you know, you've got, you know, and they're renaming all of them. <laughs> of course, yeah. I was oh, yeah. Say it's Fort Bragg, Fort, but it's Bragg. Fort yeah. Liberty now. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you've got, uh, the Camp Lejeune for the Marines, which interesting that those Marines all got poisoned yeah. uh, with the uh, chemicals in the water there. Uh, that's a big lawsuit now, but you know, how many, you know, alpha white males that were U S Marine Corps there at Cherry Point and everything uh, are going to die horribly or have died horribly because they got poisoned. Right. Yes. Who likes to poison wells? Hmm. And then, of course, you have, you know, Seymour Johnson and Golds Goldsboro and uh, just, you know, I, I, is it Goldsboro where the uh, the Broken Arrow is? Is that it? I, yeah, that's I think that's the term. It's where uh, it's where that plane crashed, mm -hmm. hauling those nuclear, those hydrogen right. bombs. Yeah. And I think there was one or maybe two that's it's near Goldsboro, North Carolina. That's where they call it a Broken Arrow is when right. there's a sort of nuclear weapon accident. Yeah, you remember the big one after 9-11 where, you know, the uh, planes took off with X number of nukes and they landed. And they, uh, 
<laughs> didn't have as many anymore under the Bush administration. Oh, really? see, I did not know that. Yeah, that was an interesting story that kind of disappeared. Wow. Yeah, that was a serious broken arrow thing there. It's like, oh, why was a bomb, you know, a bomber with military, uh, with uh, nuclear weapons flying over U.S. soil, which is a big no-no. Uh, yeah. But, but it got ordered out and then got exposed. And the thing, though, was when it landed finally, it didn't have as many nukes as when it took off. And the question was always, you know, what who happened got, to the, who, got yeah. those? who got hold of those? I'd say Israel. I'd say Israel yeah. got, a, got their hands on them, if I had to guess. Yeah. Um, well, Blackbird, I've really enjoyed this. We've been going for about an hour now, but I wanted to get your thoughts on what is going to happen in 2024. It's an election year. Ameriqua follows this sort of psychotic, frenetic four-year election cycle. And we all seen what happened with the summer of love in 2020. We've also seen the chicken swingers in their uh, tunnels up in New York. <laughs> uh, what do you, what in the hell do you think is going to happen, Blackbird? Oh, wow. I pull out my magic eight ball and my crystal ball what does the future hold uh yeah you know we're definitely in uh, the beginnings of what could turn into a hyperinflation cycle and you know as people like henry ford and uh uh you know so many others in the 20s when they we're trying to expose the Federal Reserve for what it was. It's like, you know, you're basically making money out of thin air and charging interest on it. And the people issuing the money can do anything they want with that currency, right? And, yes. uh, you know, Lindbergh was a huge uh, voice of this and what happened with him with the Lindbergh baby, right? To shut yes. him up, to run yes. him out of the country. But, you know, when you look at what happened to Germany in the 1920s with just their hyperinflation rate where the currency just got completely devalued. And, uh, you know, I you know, went and bought my usual groceries on Friday. And instead of, you know, when I first moved back here, uh, I'm a very boring shopper. Our shopping list doesn't change much from week to week. Yeah. But, you know, I could go buy the groceries for under $100, right? Yeah. It was like $300, you know, for the same uh, stuff, you know, this past yeah. Friday. I took a couple of the crew out for lunch today, and we just basically had lunch sandwiches at the mall, and it was 40 dollars right oh, yeah. for just a couple yeah. of sandwiches right uh and you know uh so you were looking at this continued hyperinflation where the value of the dollar is just you know it's running on fumes you know what does the american economy offer the world we don't produce anything the big live that service economy you know, after Bill Clinton, friend of Jeffrey Epstein, sent oh, yeah. all our industry to Mexico and China and India and Vietnam, et cetera, and all the plants and factories up in these mountains all closed down and moved offshore. You know, we don't have anything we're producing anymore. We're being flooded with the third world. We get buses loads up here. I don't know what it's like where you are, but we've got all these They're wonderful NGOs that are all interconnected. The big one is, you know, I said, uh, uh, justice for Latinos or some such foolishness. And, you know, they basically get them off the buses, set them up with welfare. You know, that's the you know, Cloward Piven plan, put them in house, government you know, housing, give them, you know, welfare cards, et cetera. And, you know, uh, the ones that do work are getting first pick of the jobs. Up here, you know, local white men, what I've found in my 20 years back up here is local white men need not apply for any job because all the companies up here have ESG quotas where we have to have diversity, right? So yeah. you've got to have that DEA rating. Um, and so, you know, what jobs there are aren't going to go to heritage Appalachian families. It's just not going to happen. No. And so... Uh, you know, how 
are we going to get through that part? And then on the international stage, you know, we have been operating under the 1982 Odin Yenin plan of Greater Israel. That was you know, the new Pearl Harbor to launch the Odin Yenin plan of taking out seven countries originally in five years. That was the Wolfowitz doctrine that they were going to take out seven countries in five years. They're behind schedule, but they are not giving up their aspirations of greater Israel. You know, Bibi Netanyahu thinks he's King David, right? And he's going yeah. to bring in from the Nile to the Euphrates. And that, you know, they took out Iraq. They took out, you know, all these other countries. Iran is the last piece of that puzzle to them. And they're trying their best to make the U.S. and Britain go fight that war for them, right? Go topple that government. Meanwhile, yeah. we saw, you know, Tucker Carlson with Putin you know, this week. I was about to yeah. ask you about that yeah. interview. What did you think about it? Oh, it was fascinating. You know, the two Kabbalah guys, you know, talking yeah. for two hours on the history of the of Russia, never once saying the J word, but yeah. they had matching red Kabbalah bracelets, which was cute, and uh, both agreeing <laughs> that the, you know, the problem with the world is neo-Nazism, right? They can't yeah. even say national socialism. It's neo-Nazism. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like, okay, if that's what you think the problem is, you know, eh, I'm not so sure about that. But, and then, you know, of course, China you know, is just an economic juggernaut because we sent them all of our business and we buy all of their slave labor crap, right? Yes. Uh, and this is, you know, a formula for disaster. But, you know, it's not just the U.S. way. They're trying to destroy every white nation to make it collapse so they can turn it into a Soviet-style client state with them in central command control. And, you know, that's their objective. And, you know, to these guys here, you talk to these Chabad Lubavitch guys, yeah, they are complete religious zealots that they are convinced that they are fixing the world to Kun Alam and Amalek is their mortal enemy. Any white person that dare stands up to them has to be destroyed because God said so. Yeah. You know, and this is just the mindset of these people. And they just think that, you know, they are supposed to lead in, you know, this new world order. And unfortunately, there's no place in that new world order for people like me and you. And you yeah. go back to, you know, Hillary Clinton and her, you know, Bill Ayers and the Weather Underground and Saul Alinsky, you know, that's what they want is collapse. First rule of social organizing is, you know, social disorganizing. You tear down what's there and replace it with something new. And that's what we see here. And, you know, all these community organizers here, they are you know, just targeting all the old white Christian leadership and saying, you've got to go. There's no place for you here. Yeah. You know, so this is what we're up against. So what's your take on you know, how this is going to play out you know, after New Year's? Well, I thought the uh, tunnels were quite interesting. <laughs> um, that just re in a, a picture of a bloody mattress, um, you know, just all sorts of suspicious things. Actually, I seen the other day there was a Brooklyn uh, building that actually collapsed that was in the, in a com Jewish community. So it's like, I huh, saw that. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe your tunneling is not up to code. <laughs> it's not like it matters anyway, but Oh, you know, I don't, I have pondered this a lot. I, you know, it, it appears certainly that America, at least it's standing on the world stage. We are, uh, we're declining. We're declining here, of course, you know, uh, domestically. We have been for quite a while now, but also on the world stage. You know, you have those, what do they call it, the BRICS countries. Uh, right. It's, uh, you know, Russia, Iran, China, I think South Africa, maybe Brazil. Brazil, I, I yeah. Uh, but, you know, they're using, I remember in that interview, Putin was talking about how they use a yuan, or however you pronounce the Chinese mm -hmm. currency, for a lot of their... Uh, a lot of their transactions now. So it's quite apparent that we, our role is being diminished, um, which I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I don't want to be, I don't want us to be in a war with Iran, 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 however you say it. Um, you know, 
<laughs> I've heard a lot about the Houthis there in, uh, I believe, Yemen, Yemen, mm-hmm. uh, attacking shipping lanes, attacking British ships, attacking even attacking a, an American naval vessel. I didn't. Don't hold me to that. I could be wrong, but I just was scrolling and seen a headline about it mm-hmm. the other day. I don't think America is in any shape whatsoever to try to uh, send its heritage Americans off overseas. Um, You know, it's interesting, too. I've seen some social media accounts point out that the military, the army and uh, these other uh, other branches of the military, their commercials now, it's not about, uh, you know, troons and, um, you know, black and uh, diversity hires. It's like they actually made a commercial a couple of months ago that was all white men. So that sounds to me, you know, obviously like they're trying. I think they're failing. I hope they're failing. I hope all these Generation Z kids, I hope they have the sense to stay out of that shit, Um, you know, because we don't we don't want anything to do with it. Also, I think the whole uh, Ukraine Russia debacle has uh, shown America to be weak, to be honest, Um, you know, and then also. It's something interesting to watch, too, will be the case with China and Taiwan. What will China do? Exactly. Um, so yeah. I'm, I believe we're already basically in what, you know, they would call a multipolar world. You know, it's not uh, it's not going to be like it is, like it has been following the fall, you know, of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain and the Soviet Union. Um, it, it appears, you know. Uh, do you know much about Alexander Dugan? You ever listen yes. to much? Yeah. You know, he's he's certainly not one of us. You know, I don't care for the idea of Eurasianism, but he has made some pretty astute observations on geopolitics, I believe, about how things may pan out. Um, so, yeah, uh, it seems like we're sitting on a powder keg, but I don't know if the U.S. has all that much gunpowder, sadly which is a yeah. good thing for us, I would think. Yeah, and, you know, the flashpoint, you know, what will be the flashpoint? And, of course, Israel's, you know, big thing is always, and you know, I always talk about the game theory of let's you and them fight, where you have an instigator trying to get their two enemies to fight each other, right? And they usually fund both sides, right? And... You know, how many false flags has Israel done to justify wars that were later exposed as this was a false flag? You know, Vietnam, the you know, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, for example. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, the King David Hotel bombing. They tried to blame that on uh, you know Arabs. Yes. The, uh, the Levon affair, affair, Operation Susanna. They Liberty. were trying to blame that USS on Liberty. the USS Liberty. They're trying to blame it on Egypt to start World War Three back then. You know what was nine eleven? You know it was basically. Arabs did it. Trust us, right? We're your allies. We're your greatest ally. Go kill them for us. Yeah. You know, so a lot of people were really on pins and needles last night with the Super Bowl. It's oh, like, is something going to happen? Yeah, you know, with the Super Bowl, you know, uh, scripted thing. You know, I was I was honestly uh, just wondering if uh, Travis Kelsey was going to fall over with a heart attack or something. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> See him actually died theory, suddenly, but we won the game. <laughs> yeah, uh, Taylor Swift is well. She wouldn't be a widow because she's not married to him, but uh, she's single again, I guess. But anyways, I have a theory though that Travis Kelsey he probably didn't even take the vaccine. He probably just, you know, promoted it. You know, if, right. I, if I was him, I'd be like, screw this shit. You know, yeah, I'm one of the things that's, that's been declassified is how many of these world leaders got exempted from taking the actual vaccine, but yet they all went out and did the charade, you know, the pantomime of, oh, I'm getting the vaccine, you should too. And in reality, they didn't. Uh, you know, so I, yeah. I find that very telling. Yeah, did you watch the Super Bowl last night? Oh no, <laughs> I didn't. Me neither. Me neither. I I don't think I've watched a Super Bowl since Peyton Manning won yeah. his last suit, and that was in 2015. Uh, yeah, I absolutely hate. I despise the show. Uh, yes, it just. I just. 
you know, that everybody's like, oh, this is part of America. And it's like, not my America. But you know, it, it, it had some, <laughs> I, I appreciate like the history of sports kind of, you know, like the old major league, like, you know, decades ago, even the NFL, you know, like back in the seventies and the eighties, you know, it was mm -hmm. now, you know, you know, I read the other day, they're replacing the white man in the NFL, of course. I mean, the quarterback historically has been a white man's position, but, you know, you have this mulatto, uh, Patrick Mahomes. He's the new star, you know, since Tom Brady is retired. Uh, I actually read the other day just a random sports fact, and this stuck in my mind. There has not been a white cornerback, you know, corner. They play defense. They cover the receivers. There hasn't been a white cornerback start in an NFL game since Jason Seahorn of the New York Giants did back in uh, 2002. So that's been almost 22 years ago. So it's like I don't give a shit about sports anymore, but I thought that was a very uh, telling assessment of where this country's headed. You know, right. Well, you know, we see what, you know, sports ball has done to Boone, North Carolina yes. by Appalachian yes. State University. And the one of the things about, you know, athletics is so many people warned against letting professional sports into America because they said it will be nothing but trouble. You shouldn't do this. Yes, college athletics is one thing, but professional sports is a recipe for disaster. And a fellow Southerner who is one of my favorite content creators, she goes by Really Graceful. She yeah. did a piece a few years ago on the dark history of the Super Bowl that I really recommend everybody yes, go that was watch. Good. You know, that it just shows who was behind creating professional sports and, you know, the ties to Jewish organized crime and gambling, prostitution, oh, yeah. drugs, etc., human trafficking, all those horrible things that, you know, somehow became the American pastime. And, it's, oh, yeah. you know, it is very good. She did an excellent job. I think it's only like 20 minutes long, but it is a highly it's, dense yes. 20 minutes. And, you know, the fact that, you know, their business charter registered them as an entertainment. This is not yes, sports because not, if they were yes. sports, they'd have to play by the rules. But if they're entertainment, it's like championship wrestling. Not, Who do we want liable. to win? You yeah, know? they're not liable. Yeah, and so you basically just have these guys in cute little outfits, you know, uh, playing out a pantomime, yeah. you know, and that's, you know, that's not ethical in my book, but, you know, that's where, what this is. is where we are. So it's the bread and circuses of late Rome, you know. It's the bread and circuses, and that, you know, these people that, you know, they don't identify with their local community anymore. They don't identify with their local church anymore. They identify as the, the part of their local team, you know, yeah. oh, I'm from, you know, North Carolina. So I support the, you know, Charlotte Panthers. Right. And it's like, yeah. who cares? You know, why yeah. do you want a professional sports team? And, you know, we that can do a whole show from your area. Nobody yeah. from your area. There yeah. is no blood connection. No. And, yeah, you know, we could do a whole show on just the racket of these people coming in, pushing to get some kind of pro team in an area, build a stadium. They get halfway through it. The money's gone. And then the taxpayer has to come in and finish the project, right? And that yeah. has happened time after time after time. And it's always the promise of this will bring in revenue. This will bring in jobs, the blah, job. blah, blah, blah. And it never pans out, but the rich get richer and the poor get poor. Yep, absolutely. You know, you mentioned a minute ago uh, uh, sports books and fixings. Uh, that reminded me of the 1919 World Series, you know, the Black Sox and uh, Arnold Rothstein, uh, the Chicago White Sox. You have you read about that before? No, tell me. Is this a good uh, fear and loathing story? <laughs> yeah. Um, Shoeless Joe Jackson, he was a Southern boy. He was from uh, South Carolina, actually. Uh, he couldn't read, couldn't write, but he could hit home runs. He was on his way to be one of the greatest ever. He played for the Chicago White Sox, and he 
<sighs> let's see. They played the Cincinnati Reds in the 1919 World Series. And a guy, a Jew up in Chicago, I believe, named Arnold Rothstein, he was the one who got to several of the White Sox players. There were eight of them. And Shoeless Joe Jackson was one of them. He paid them all off, paid them thousands of dollars, which back then that was a lot of money, but they were to throw the World Series. It ended up happening, although Joe Jackson, he he performed very well in that World Series. It was like, you know, he didn't give a shit. He's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to play as hard as I can. But he got blacklisted along with the other seven players that – were confirmed to have taken Rothstein's money. But, you know, that just opens up an opportunity, you know, for, say, organized crime and uh, gambling and all these things. Uh, that was something – I was a pretty big baseball fan growing up. I played it and loved it. And I remember reading about that all those years ago as a kid. Oh, that was the thing. You know, we love to play sports. You know, I love to play sports. But, you know, there's a big difference between athletics – and professional sports, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, one of the other aspects you touched on there was, you know, the guy c c was really good at playing ball, but couldn't read or write. And it's infuriating that our universities now are now integrated after the, you know, uh, civil rights act, you know, the, uh, that was pushed by, by pushed through by Jews, of course. But you've got so many of these, you know, non-whites in white universities that have no business being in an academic setting. You know, they, uh, like the ones here, it's amazing. Yeah, they could barely speak English, but they can play sports ball. And they're getting the full scholarship. And the other aspect of this is, you know, just part of the nature is how many rapes happen on these college campuses now because oh, yeah. of all these high adrenaline. I'm somebody, you know, I'm here on a full scholarship, you know, how, you know, and you're trying to get the st rape statistics out of the university of North Carolina system. It, I would do better getting Pentagon secrets. You know, it is amazing yeah. <laughs> how much they cover that up. They always keep it as an internal thing. You know, don't get the local law enforcement involved. We'll handle it within the university, but I would love to see the actual numbers since, you know, the 1960s of how many white women are raped on college campuses by these people on sports scholarships of one variety or another. I think that would be very telling. And then, you know, you, once you get to the pro ball, you know, how many of these people have their careers ended because they get exposed to being a serial rapist. You know, they're a great football player, but they also had this pension of liking to rape women, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that's just, you know, the other thing is like, why bring that into an academic setting? Of course, yeah, I've lost all respect for the university systems. It's oh, yeah. such a corrupt, you know, system anymore. You know, it's all about, you know, putting people in debt and, yes. you know, just, and it's so sad what the, especially North Carolina, you know, we had, you know, one of the first public universities, the University of Chapel Hill. Yeah. And for the longest time, that was the model of the world. You know, we have finally outdone Europe in public education. And look where it is now. I went, uh, got, I think the last ball, sports ball game, a uh, friend of mine got his tickets for one of the first UNC games. He was a huge Carolina fan. He said, oh, come on, we'll have a great time. We'll go out to dinner in Chapel Hill. It'll be fun. So yeah. we went, and I'm sitting there, and the entire starting lineup of UNC Chapel Hill, the Tar Heels, right? Yeah. Not a single white guy on the floor in the starting lineup. When was this? Uh, that oh, was mommy, probably about maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, and I yeah, my dad, he uh, he was always a big Tar Heels fan, at least in basketball. Yeah. I think one of the good last white college players there had was that Tyler Hansbrough. 
and he was he played for the Tar Heels back in like the late aughts. So, I, which I don't keep up with any of this anymore. But yeah, it, I mean, it just goes to show. And then I mean, it's the it's not only the rapes and everything, but look at how the media promotes. It's like, oh hey, you young white girl, get this big black stud here. You know, he's so athletic. It's it brings yeah, that's that. That's the too. other thing is, yeah, you know, that uh, here it's you would not believe all the parading mud sharks with their pet black guy. You yeah, know, it's like, oh, I'm not racist. Look, I've got a black boyfriend. It's like, yeah, come see me in about a year and tell me how it worked out for you. Hope you, you know, I hope you have they, all your teeth in your head. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're raising that black kid who uh, looks uh, nothing with like a 70 you. IQ on your own. Yeah, looks nothing like you, but yeah, hey, I guess it's your genes, you know. Yeah, yeah so. I mean, it's uh, but, but, but uh, well, let me ask you this we go back to the topic of this year. What do you foresee happening with the election? Oh, that is such the wild card because, you know, at this point, you know, will we have an election or will we have an event? You know, will the Democratic Party actually run the incumbent Joe Biden? Will he be fit this, you know, recent thing about the uh, secret files in the garage and saying he's not uh, culpable because he's not fit to stand trial, you know, basically. Yeah. It's like, okay, if he's not fit to stand trial, you know, is he fit to be president? And, you know, so who are they going to run if not Joe Biden? And are they going to succeed? And, you know, what's the Supreme Court going to do with, you know, Colorado's, you know, taking Trump off the ballot? You know, so many yeah. states are trying to use that legalese thing of, oh, because of the insurrection of January 6th and that, you know, the uh, uh, the clauses after the Civil War, we're going to take him off the ballot. You know, it's like, yeah. OK, this makes sense. Uh, and so, you know, we have a mess uh, in this nation and the same thing, you know, at the state levels, you know, here in North Carolina, you know. We're looking at having our attorney general, you know, the carpetbagger commie boy wonder, Josh Stein, as possibly uh, following COVID King Roy Cooper as governor. You know, and if wow. that happens, this state is doomed, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know uh, because Josh Stein is just... You know, we've got to bring in the third world and we've got to, you know, make these white people pay for slavery <coughs> and the Civil War. And just, you know, we just you know, got to remove every white person from any position of power in this state. You know, and that's you know, Josh Stein and he's the attorney general. You know, and is yeah, he I've be heard governor. That, I've heard that name, Josh Stein. Before. Oh, he's a piece of work. Let me tell you. Good Lord. You know, uh. Okay, what do you think about this? You know, with what happened in 2020, and uh, I was going to say, Blackbird, check out a guy. He's in the chat here. His name's Den Denimus Sumi did. But back in 2020, he actually called this. He was talking about he wanted – I mean, it was pretty, pretty great observations on his part. He was talking about – what was going to happen with the election and like the fraud and everything. And he said, he kind of called it like a couple of months beforehand. He said he wanted to see something happen to where Trump would have to fight his ass off, even though Trump apparently didn't really fight his ass off, you know, uh, it's really interesting. I would check that out. But in the chat, I just wanted to say that he said, I have the feeling that Blomp is going to end up in a casket or in a penitentiary if he doesn't drop out. Do you foresee, you know, I think the system, the federal government, I think it is its credibility and its legitimacy are already extremely low after what happened in 2020. So for me, the question is, is the uniparty, is the system, in order to keep Trump out, are they completely, are they willing to throw, you know, further erode their own legitimacy? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think something like that could happen? Well, we saw it in the 60s, you know, with Bobby Kennedy, you know, 
kill him to keep him out of the election because if he becomes president, he will prove who killed his brother, John Kennedy, and we can't have that, right? Yeah. So let's blame it on a Palestinian guy. <laughs> yeah. It's Iran, it's Iran, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, these people are ruthless. Yeah, that's one of the things about the deep state, you know, the uniparty, whatever you want to call it. You know, it is a ruthless, intransigent thing that is beyond good and evil. They just think that, you know, the ends justify the means and they are completely justified in doing whatever they need to do to achieve their objectives. And, you know, a political assassination is just one of the tools in the tool bag. Uh, if they yeah. have to, you know, crash the economy. Uh, this is the amount of power. Yeah, that's one of the things when you have, you know, your banking system outsourced to a private Jewish bank, the Federal Reserve, that we're still not allowed to audit or even know who all sits on the board, right? Talk about yeah. a shadow government. You know, why is there such secrecy about the Federal Reserve and who runs it? You know, and why can't we follow Ron Paul's lead and bring back our you know, constitutional authority to print and coin our own currency? Um, but, you know, that these people will destroy it rather than let somebody else have it. And that's part of the Samson option with these people. You know, if, if we feel threatened, we will destroy it all rather than giving up power. And it's all about absolute power. That's real politic. And yeah. they play hardball and they play to win. And white people need to get their head in the game. If white people got their head in the game, we could fix this. But, you know, if people continue being distracted uh, with every, you know, you know, Taylor Swift or <laughs> you know, let's go to a Taylor Swift concert or go to the Super Bowl, yeah. you know, um, or let's go collect Beanie Babies. That'll be fun. Uh, you know, it's just, you gotta you know, pay attention, but you know, uh, when your media is completely compromised and this is one of the things I love about the internet is, you know, we're showing just how compromised the mockingbird media is on, you know, reporting of everything and how they're trying yeah. so hard to shut people like me and you down. You know, we can't be listened to no matter how yeah. accurate our facts, our hate facts are. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Do you, do you think Biden will run for another term or do you think that he is done for? I, you know, I, well, you know, I've, I'm an old man now, uh, and I've seen so many, you know, really bad politicians just manage to keep limping along because they have such a powerful support base. And, yeah. you, know, they're, you know, your puppets can stay in office forever because they're not actually doing anything but repeating what their owners tell them to do. You know, a real leader, you know, they have a rough time staying in office, right? Yeah. Uh, but you know, just what we've seen with these really bad uh, people in various offices, you know, will they, you know, continue to prop up Biden, or are they going to throw him under the bus for something else? And if so, what is the something else? You know, what do they have to choose from? You know. I, yeah, I don't know who else they would run because I don't think. Uh, I don't think uh, Kamala is very uh, popular in the least. Um, Biden is on his last. And I, I think they're starting to throw him under the bus, but I don't know what option they would. I've heard some people say Michelle Obama or Michael Obama. Big Mike. Yeah, we need Big yeah. Mike. He'll fix everything, right? Oh, man. Sure. He'll run it in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Let's see. And, you know, so, Newsom from California, you know, yeah, how would that, that fly? Uh, then, you know, it's just. I don't uh, know. There's a lot of questions. Yeah. I try not to pay too much attention to it, but unfortunately, even though I'm trying to not pay attention to it, I still see things, you know. So, right. I mean, I don't know. Um, just curious, who would you think Trump would pick as his running partner? 
Oh, wow. That is the question of the hour, right? And uh, thank God it hopefully won't be Nikki Haley. That was my big fear. For Jesus the Christ. Time. Hell yeah. no. Oh, yeah, man. It's like, man, please don't do that. Um, yeah. I mean, then, I've heard Christy Nome. I think mm-hmm. she's the governor of South Dakota. I've also heard Tim Scott. Ain't he uh, some black politician from yeah, South Carolina? From South Carolina. I've heard Vivek. Uh, what do you think about that Vivek Ramaswamy guy? Oh man, I can't stand him. I can't. I, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, he says a lot of things. He says he, all the right things, right? Yeah, he says the things that would appeal to our side, but it's just like, why can we not get a white man that can speak for us? Why do we have to have this Indian? You know, I've seen him and. I seen him and Nikki Haley. I just seen videos, I think, on Twitter of them going at each other uh, on the debate stage. And I was just thinking to myself, I was just like, huh, there's two of them, yeah. two of them. And look you what's know. happened to the UK. Look what's happened to Ireland. You know, it's like suddenly all these great European cities, you know, suddenly have Indian presidents and prime ministers. You yeah. Know, it's like, and it's like, um, okay. You know, you don't speak for me, you know. Yeah. It's like you don't speak for me, you know. It's like these people, they want us to think, you know, it's just like I even hear people big names on the dissident right. They absolutely love Vivek. And I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, I don't need I don't need this street street shitter to speak for me. <laughs> like I ain't got the goddamn sense to speak for myself, you know. I don't yeah. I mean it's just it's all theater, though. You know, that's I'm, the thing. I mean, uh, it's it's all theater. I don't try to get caught up in the shit. I mean, yeah. Well, I always tell people, you know, at this point, with the amount of control that the deep state has, it who's in the White House, you know, does that really matter? Yeah. And if, as far as affecting your local life, I would be paying attention to who you're electing as your local sheriff. Yes. And your local medical examiner or coroner. You know, those are the two most important offices in your local county. You know, as a sheriff that's got your back looking after the local interest and a local coroner that will actually give real information, right? And also that coroner is the only one that can relieve the sheriff of duty in most states, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that level of local politics, you know, who is on your county commissioners and, you know, paying attention to all of these NGO groups that are slime molding their way into your communities. Yes. You know, and I hate the Melissa.com site got so convoluted back when we first started discovering this five fifth generation warfare tactic of you using NGOs there's this site called melissa.com where you could basically put in your zip code and it would tell you every 501c3 NGO group operating in that zip code and tell you how much money they had, how much they had, tax returns, et cetera. Oh man, this is fascinating. Yeah. I've never heard of this. The site is still up, but it's so convoluted and it's now a pay site. It used to be free, right? But, Uh. um, but it's really hard to find the NGO section. It's still there, but you got to dig for it. Uh, any of you code guys out there that want to write some good code, basically copy what Melissa.com used to be. But it was just a, such a great tool because I could you know, put in a zip code and tell you every NGO group that was operating in my community, who was in charge of it, you know, how much money they were coming in, where the main donors were. Right. So you could quickly see, you know, oh, that's interesting. This, you know, NGO group is getting all this money from, you know, these other NGO groups and George Soros Foundation and this, that and the other. And you can start connecting the dots of all these shell, you know, limited liability companies and uh, philanthropy groups that were destroying your community. And, you know, you could single these people out. Uh, And so that's the kind of thing. You know, I think they may have uh, put the kibosh on that because they seen that, like, hey, oh yeah, we were using, starting to notice. Yeah, and, this was around 2007, 2006 when we really started seeing, 
you know, hey, these NGO groups are, you know, weaponized and yes. organized and, you know, who are they? And, uh, and Melissa.com just was the thing in your tool belt to combat them. And uh, it nice. was very effective for a while, but it's like I said, it's so convoluted now. It's not much use unless you really want to, you know, invest the time in it. Yeah. Well, I was going to say uh, the last few minutes here, if uh, anybody in the audience, if you've got any questions, now's the time to type them up and send them in. And I've got one question right here from uh, how you doing Duterte fan. It's good to see you. He asks, do you have the climate change panic over there? They keep trying. We've got all these NGO, you know, groups that are, you know, green and then just, you know, trying to push that. And I think people are just, they uh, aren't in panic mode. I think, I think uh, a lot of, I think a lot of the fear, the fear, yeah. fear factor isn't there with the climate like it was. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the things about fear programming, trauma-based fear program, is it's hard to maintain a state of fear in a population, uh, and it's very effective at first. But you know, people just get numb to it, where they just you know, I don't care anymore. If it happens, it happens, and yeah. then the effectiveness of that tool wears off. And I think. You know, people are just really disgusted with the left so much that they, and the, what is it, Greta Thornburg or whatever her name yeah. is. You know, she was, uh, you know, she was the best thing that happened to us, you know, because she was just so <laughs> annoying. It's kind of like when, you know, Abe Foxman was replaced with Jonathan Nosferatu Greenblatt. That was yeah. the best thing <laughs> to happen to white people in America in a very long time because he's just such an irritating individual, individual that everybody's just like, I don't care anymore. You know, I, you know, I don't care if Jonathan Greenblatt thinks I'm a uh, white supremacist or a Nazi or a redneck or whatever. I just don't care. You know, um, absolutely. So Greta was like that. It's just, she was so annoying. And you know, all these people, you're flying around the country in their Lear jets talking about the environment, you know, like Taylor Swift, for example, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, the double standards, you know, people see through that and uh, it's wearing off. Of course, the politicians are still getting big money to push it because there's lots, you know, the Soros Foundation, et cetera. You know, they're still dumping all that money into it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think some of the, for those that were paying attention, I think uh, climate change has kind of been seen as a fraud. If you paid attention to what happened with the Nord Stream, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline. Didn't that event produce the most, uh, the leak? Remember when was uh, that? Was it early 2023? Yeah. yeah. You know, that put out more CO2 than any, uh, any, uh, other event in history maybe. And, uh, well, we're still here, I guess. Yeah, right. Um, let me see. Is there any, uh, Hey, what's up? Be wise yeah. serpents. Welcome. I don't think I know you. Uh, anybody else got any questions? Now's the yes, time ask to ask me anything. <laughs> Remember to tip your bartenders. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to, I'm trying to wait a second. Um, I was going to ask you got any, uh, any good new uh, guests coming on your podcast anytime soon? Or well, just so happens. I got confirmation that Mr. Dennis Fetcho, uh, okay. He was like me, telecommunications guy, and he actually got run out of the you know uh, U.S. I just got run into exile. Uh, yeah, but you know he they actually you know ran him completely out. But he is uh, in Saudi now, and he has a show wow. every Here Saturday is. forever called Inside the Eye Live with Dennis Fetcho, and he's like me where he looks at the political but also the esoteric. You know, he's just like oh, nice. into the, the, the headset he on, of these people. I was going to ask, and is he on Republic Broadcasting? No, network? unfortunately, I'd love for him, uh, Republic, to carry his show, but he's on Speak Free Radio. Okay. Uh, he used to be on uh, uh, Revolution Radio, uh, and then he moved over to Speak Free. Uh, but yeah, he you know, goes back to the Oracle days. If you remember Oracle Network, you know, that's where he got his first start. 
uh, was way back in the Oracle days. And uh, if you the, would, uh, I was going to say, if you would on Telegram, send me a link to his channel. I'll be glad to do that. On, yeah. Or, on a uh, speak free because I'd like to listen to him. I'm I've got, yeah, he's a very interesting in guy. Yeah. Uh, we got a question here. What's up, man? Dale. It's good to see you. Let me post it. Will Texas and the red States revolt. I know the governor there in a vacuum wouldn't do anything, but the situation may be getting out of control. What's your thoughts? BB9? Well, that's one of the things you keep seeing is, is it time for secession? And what would happen if we had a new confederacy with Texas up through Virginia, right? And what an economic juggernaut that would be. Uh, and, you know, would there be enough political will to push a secession movement? And if so, how would it play out? Now, a lot of people in predictive programming you know, saying that they are trying to get a real civil war, not like the U.S. Civil War, which was a war between the states, war of northern aggression. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, but, you know, a real civil war, like during the Revolutionary War of 1776, you know, that was a civil war because you had the loyalists and you had the revolutionaries in the same communities, right? And so this idea of basically you know, ramping up the pitch of the anti-whiteism so much that basically you have, you know, all the diversity declaring open warfare on the white people and white people having to basically get weaponized to defend themselves, right? That yeah. would be a real civil war situation that then what would play out of trying to quell it and is this, you know, a way to open up to UN troops to come in and put down the rebellion and restore order, right? So yeah. one of the big movies that's coming out at the beginning of the year is Civil War. Yeah. And it's exactly along those sort of lines. Predictive you know? programming, perhaps. Predictive programming, right. So, you know, that's one of the things. And you see so well, there was a bill... Uh, introduced this past week where they're trying to outlaw militia groups. Right? Yeah, I heard that. that yeah, news. that, you know, people that get together and work out and train, that they're going to try to make that illegal at the federal level. You know, how is that going to play out considering the Second Amendment says you are required as a, you know, as a constitutional republic to have a well-organized and well-armed militia, you know? yeah. Oh, it's uh, it's interesting times that we live in. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I just I just feel so sorry for this young generation because, you know, I grew up in the '60s and '70s, right? Yeah. And you know that was like this golden age, you know. Yeah. Of. It was just, well, there was no diversity in my you know, elementary school, my scout troop, my high school, my local college. You know, it's only since you know, the last 20 years that it's completely changed the dynamics up here. Yeah. And now in some of these rural areas, the white kids are the minority. The local heritage Appalachian white kids are now minorities in these schools just like in ireland and england you know france you know they are being pushed out and they are making those kids lives total hell imagine yeah. having to go into that kind of jungle every day uh, just you know you're in survival mode waiting to see who's going to sucker punch you by your locker you know that day yeah right and you know uh in his uh, manifesto between the lines of drift, Eric Rudolph talked about that. He grew up down in Homestead, Florida, uh, mm -hmm. before he moved to the Nantahala uh, Forest when he was 14. But he he dedicated a chapter or two that was talking about all the shit that he had to deal with down there in Homestead, Florida. Um, you know, I'm serious. I, I think... Uh, whites we're going to have to become a bit more savage in our dealings uh, at least on a personal level um i mean you you if you have children 
you need to train them to know how to fight and you know they need to get a little bit of street smarts you could say because i mean even though here in appalachia is uh largely why i see what's going to happen they're going to start bussing these uh these migrants up here so you know we need to be prepared for that instance and uh you know be able to hold our own you know the days of just uh being non-confrontational when you're confronted it, it ain't gonna work i get so tired of seeing that shit some of these mm -hmm. channels post you know oh, this white kid's getting the shit beat out of him and all he does is ball up in a ball. I want to see otherwise, you know. I ain't encouraging violence, but hey, you know, you stand up. You know, I have learned this firsthand. Blacks, they're fearful of the feral white. If there's a white person that's like, hey, I'm hip to the game, I know what you're trying to do and it's not going to work on me. You know, they kind of look at you different, you know? Oh, definitely. You need to if have, you try to play that soft guy. Oh, I don't see race. Oh, you know, and they're oh, going to, they're going to eat you alive. They eat yes. you alive. Right. So there needs to be a sort of militant instruction for the youth right. that know how to deal with this. Right. But, uh, well, I think, uh, let's see. There's one. Well, I, I'll ask this one last question. How you doing, Finn Wraith? It's good to see you. Um, are the whites starting to move from there to some other part of the country? Uh, uh, he's talking about, I guess, Boone in Appalachia, where you're at. Unfortunately, the reasons are people are selling family lands yes for what yes. they think is a big thing of money and then going and buying a house you know in some place that's not so rural you know someplace closer to the cities etc because you know in the suburbs etc um you know that's a disturbing trend because you're seeing these family farms that have been here since colonial generations times, generational generations. families just shut down and they become strip malls and gated communities, right? Yes. And so you see the families, you know, basically mom, dad die. They, you know, we're going to sell the farm and split the money rather than, you know, one of the family, family members moving in and keeping it. the family together yes. and putting it back in production. That's, that infuriates me. Yeah. When I see and that's what I went through. That's what I went through with my family, you know, I was, oh, man. You know, my plan was to put the hundred acre wood back into full production. And my brother and sister had other plans. It's like, no, that's our retirement. We're selling it. And so, oh, I, man. yeah. And so that's heartbreaking. That's shit how it runs. is. I know our family land back home, me and my brother, we've already resolved, you know, we're not, that's never, that's, that's never leaving our hands. And we won't be the oh, ones good. we're going to teach our kids, you know, to, Hey, this is, this is your land. It's been in our family for seven. Well, with my kids, eight generations now, my, my daughter and his daughter, that's eight generations. We ain't, you know, we ain't giving that up. Screw that. And you know? you know, when you look at the, you know, the, the deep state mindset is one of the big things is the destruction of the nuclear family Yep. and no private property. And oh, you can yeah. just see that attitude playing out where they're making it impossible for you to own a piece of land and have a family on it. Yeah, they're yes. just trying to block that every way they can. And of course, one of the big things is have those big bags of money saying, Oh, we'll give you a top tempting. dollar for that. Yeah. And I get, you know, uh, letters every week from all these, you know, like Vanguard and BlackRock front companies willing to buy my land. We will give you this much money right yeah. now for that farmland. And it's like, who are you? All these people are out of state, right? Who are you? Yeah. How do you know I have land and it's none of your business? And uh, it's just you know, maddening that you know, they're just really trying to push that, you know, buying up the family land, especially in this Appalachian it's, mountain range. They hate us because we are a fierce, independent people. And they hate that. <laughs> they want us dependent in slavery. You know, independent in slavery, I guess that's to say. Oh, let's see. Well, um, I've got six acres and acres in South Louisiana, but it's compromised down here. I'm going to have to leave way too many nons. I've... Hmm, 
I don't want to tell you to run scaffolder. You know, I don't want to tell you to, you know, just ditch. But I mean, if you can find six acres, say in Appalachia or somewhere, uh, somewhere further north, by all means. Um, there's one more question I'll ask. It's my, from my friend Oxstone. Let me post it here. If there is a point where or moralistic rebellion cannot be accomplished regardless of excessive continuing justification. What is a proper solution for those individuals who cannot end the turmoil? Um, mm, that's a deep question. Mm -hmm. Not quite sure what he's asking there. Yeah. Moralistic rebellion. Um, uh, cannot end the turmoil. If you could uh, clarify a little bit, Stone Ox, here in the next minute or so, we'll try to answer it. I'm going to say as far as ending turmoil, there's a concept called the finite game and the infinite game. And it's a book, a book that I read last year, but the name of the author uh, escapes me right now. But a finite game is like your typical battle. It is your typical just game. Like, hey, we were talking about the Super Bowl earlier. That's a finite game. It has a defined beginning and end. Infinite games, on the other hand, are, say, religion, procreation, and uh, basically the infinite game is saying that you play in order to keep on playing. A finite game, there is a defined end. There's a goal. So, I mean, as far as – I don't think we'll ever end the turmoil – I mean, life's a struggle, and it always will be. All you can do is just the classical message. I hope that answered that somewhat, yeah. Ox Stone. Yeah, uh, that is a, one of my favorite books when I was first getting introduced to game theory, and a Finite and Infinite Games by James P. Kars. Yeah, that's who it is, yes. Yes, and part of my work in game theory and the uh, game I'm developing hills and holes is it's not about winning the game. It's about continuing to play. And we find ourselves in an existential battle. You know, there are pow powerful people that want us gone. They want us exterminated. And when you're in an existential battle, merely surviving is an act of rebellion. It is. Absolutely. So, you know, the idea of just, you know, keep living, keep, you know, fighting, and that is an act of rebellion. And it's like you said, the infinite game. You're playing to play, not to win. Yeah. You know, winning is just continuing to play. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you again, Blackbird Nine. We've been going for two hours. Oh, really this has it. been great. I really I've enjoyed you. it. I'm glad it finally worked out. I hate. We've, I know. We've trying to do <laughs> this for months for now. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm glad it's finally panned out. Uh, yeah. I want to say the door is always open. You're always welcome back. And uh, do you have any final? Final words you want to say to the audience? Well, just I want to invite you back on the Snack Shack sometime. I yeah, I really like enjoyed on. you and the Hillbilly Professor, so y'all need to come back on soon. Yeah, love I'd, to have you. I enjoyed the uh, call in feature that RBN does. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. I'd like to do call ins on here somehow if I could work it out one day. Yeah. But I have thoroughly enjoyed it, and I really appreciate all the people listening. I've been in, uh, really enjoying all the comments in the chat. And uh, really good questions. So uh, yeah. I'd like to see everyone come and join us at the Snack Shack some Saturday night. And, and uh, I'll, I'll post a, anytime you send me a link on Telegram to your upcoming show. Don't hesitate. I'll post right. it on my Twitter and on my channels for sure. Right. And you catch right. the, the Snack Shack Saturday nights from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern on both uh, the RBN, Republic Broadcasting, and also on the Spreaker Network. So uh, yep. come out and check us out. All right. Well, I want to thank you again, Blackbird9. I want to thank the audience, and I hope you all have a great evening out there. Thank you all so right. much. Thank you. Bye-bye.